being known for being a high-end mixing engineer in the last decade, how do you feel this is applied into your music production? Well, I think there's there's two answers to the question. Um, first of all, I hope I can say that um, this uh, long time of, of, of working with countless um, client projects and basically an endless uh, stream of case studies of, of mixing projects um, across my mixing desk. Um, I think this has made me a better producer because um, I've seen so many different uh, different situations, different productions. Um, I've had to solve so many different problems and I've also been working on so much great stuff where um, the challenge wasn't um, so much uh, to solve all the problems, but to uh, not uh, create any additional problems. I'd like to think there's a fairly broad uh, spectrum of um, things I've uh, seen and heard. And of course, this has made me a more experienced producer also. And um, this is something I'm very, very grateful for because a side effect of being a mixing engineer with all these incredible artists for so long is that um, I also have a very, very privileged view on how so many great uh, people in this, in this industry are doing their things. And of course, this does something in the back of my brain. But um, on the other hand, I would like to say that as far as inspiration goes, I try to block this a little bit off because um, I think that um, electronic music sometimes is a little bit too self-referential and a little bit too much focus on what's the ne next big thing and what's developing and then you want to create something in the same vein and of course this dialogue with other producers can be interesting but I try to not let that infiltrate in my work so much because my inspiration when I'm creating music doesn't really come from listening to other people's tracks or something like that it's more like me being in the studio in a dialogue with the synthesizers and the instruments and not so much the music that I've been listening to before. From a listener's perspective, one thing that's captured my attention would be your intricate use of note intervals and the twist in sound design that really tells a story in your journeys. Could you tell us a little bit what is your approach and how are you working with this? I think there's again two aspects to it. And first of all, um, I think what you mean with the note intervals and this kind of stuff is that I'm not really using so many pads in my music. You need pads sometimes to just warm something up or make it thicker or wider sounding, but um, I oftentimes feel that pads also can make it a little bit too too cheesy in a way and take away from the from the muscle uh, inside the groove and stuff like that. And so um, I'm really, really careful with um, using pads and I don't do it too often. And I certainly very rarely use um, chord progressions with a pad because this is what I sometimes perceive as cheesy. Or maybe I just didn't find the good way how to make them work for me yet. But um, what instead oftentimes do is uh, create structure of the harmonies in the track with monophonic lines mostly. And, I think without inflating my point and without trying to, to make this sound more interesting than it is, I think the concept behind it is a bit similar to, to how a string quartet plays because it's also several monophonic lines um, going alongside each other and um, most of the time they would really only play one note at a time each and so the, the, the chord structure of the uh, music isn't coming from one instrument like a piano which is playing a chord but it's coming from the combination of all these monophonic lines which together form the harmonies and this is something that I like a lot because it also leaves some aspects of the harmonies a little undefined or you can pretend it's maybe the way uh, depending on the way how you listen to it it might be perceived as two different chords at the same time and it's it's a little more open in terms of the structure and then of course you can also play with I think in, in the, the Latin word for this ambitus which is the which is the interval between the lowest note and the piece and the highest note in the piece 
And just as we open up filters uh, towards the drop and, and get more intensity in the frequency range, you can also play with the actual interval between the lowest and the highest note in the track and you can put them closer to each other and then you can, you can maybe drop the bass one octave and um, take the lead one octave up and then, then you suddenly have a much higher interval from the lowest to the highest note and then you can use this as one of the tools to create excitement in the, in the track and in the composition and I think I'm really really aware of these things and yeah I really enjoy to 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 create harmonic structures this way because like I said it's it, it, it hopefully avoids uh, to sound uh, uh, too cheesy and it also uh, yeah is is a little more of an undefined open way of, of, of playing with harmonies where mm -hmm. sometimes the chord change isn't really happening but there's just something which um, suggests is happening in a way and it's, it's hard to put this in words but um, it's uh, to me to me this is a very interesting moment when I when I start working on a track and then I layer different things and suddenly suddenly progressions emerge from what used to be a monophonic line to begin with. Could you give us a short demonstration of what we just talked about? Sure. Um, I'm going to play one section of uh, Pluton, which is the closing track of my um, upcoming album on Awesome Soundwave. And I think um, this example might highlight uh, this combination of monophonic lines because there's a bass uh, stab rolling thing from the Moog Modular and then there's a little melody, a plucky melody from Juno, which is creating this kind of uh, progression or movement between the chords and then there's also a couple other lines all playing around each other and um, it's, it's all based on the same root harmony all the time but at the same time there's other voices meandering along and I think it's exactly what we have just been talking about. I was listening to your some of your releases and I really noticed is that you really use a lot is playing with the stereo field, which is something I feel like tends to be sometimes a little bit overlooked as well and not fully used to advantage. Ultimately, I think a good sounding production or good sounding mix um, is good sounding mainly also because there are contrasts between something that's very narrow and very wide or very low and very high. So it's, it's when, when everything has the same quality, like all signals are super wide, then um, you don't have a reference point and then nothing really seems wide. I think in general, I'm, I'm pretty much aware of, of contrasts and musical elements and I try to, to uh, put them into my productions also and I think I'm also not so much afraid of, of pushing the envelope a bit because through my mixing experience I have a quite good overview over what's um, still acceptable in terms of mono compatibility. I'm, I'm just not worried to, to, to put something on the side or make something white or so because I know um, how to check whether it's um, still okay in a way. Um, yeah, the, the combination of me having, I think, a solid knowledge of, of how far I can push it, plus the desire to, to push it far because I want excitement. I want to create drama through contrasts. Um, and I think the, the result of that is what you're hearing. How else do you like to work with contrast? Well, one thing that's also interesting to, to focus on is spectral inversion. Everybody knows what it is, but probably um, this, this, this word is not so common. Everybody knows uh, the intensity right before the drop, when, when filters are going up and snare rolls are becoming louder, and there's a lot of density in the mid-range and then the drop comes and suddenly the kick comes in and some hi-hat comes in at the top. So it's, it's, it's really a very, very dense cluster of mid-range frequencies before the drop and then in the drop there is almost no mid-range anymore and um, what was mid-range now becomes a fat bass drum and some, some powerful offbeat element in the highs. And this is the spectral inversion that you, that you create excitement. Basically, if you visualize it, then um, one thing would be the positive and one thing would be the negative. It's really like, like shapes, 
complementing each other. And um, this is something we can also um, look at a spectrogram, which basically visualizes what we've just been talking about. Um, there's an um, X axis, which is the uh, time scale, and then there's a Y axis with the frequencies, which means um, in the lower sections you would have the bass, and in the higher section you would have the um, uh, high frequency elements and it plots them over time. It's not like a normal analyzer which um, only has a, yeah, it, it only, the normal analyzer only di displays what happens in one moment and this uh, meter basically visualizes what happens with the frequency spectrum over time. And so this um, spectral inversion that I've been talking about, we can see on this um, meter. Perfect. So let's listen to another track, which is uh, pretty much the centerpiece of my album, I would say, with a very, very nice vocal by Oslo Rucker. And um, this is one of the breakdown parts going into a drop. And I think it's, it's a good example um, of what we just talked about. Whether to burn, or whether to build, whether to kill, or whether to create, whether to make new, whether to make better. Whether to me, together, what we leave here matters. So when um, we stop the playback, we can really see uh, the breakdown part with a vocal and um, the, the, this cloudy cluster of frequencies in the mid range, and then uh, we go to the to the drop part on the right hand side where you can see the bass drums and the toms, the green dots in the bottom, and then the offbeat hi hats in the top, and you can see the the black background in the mid range, which means um, it's basically inverted. We have almost only exclusively mid range in the breakdown, and then almost no mid range in the drop, and this is basically one of the things that um, many producers are just uh, maybe without visualizing it this way uh, doing because it's very effective and I think it's also nice to, to visualize it like this and be aware of how this actually works and this is one of the one of the ways how you can um, yeah use contrasts in the mix or in the production to, to, to create a dramatic shift of the tension basically. So when it comes to delays, do you have particular ways you like to work with delays that you could describe to us? My initial reaction would be to say I'm using them everywhere, which um, is not true, but um, uh, I think it's it's worth pointing out that um, both uh, delays and reverbs pretty much, I would say, are the genre-defining uh, effects. Like, imagine techno without reverb and delay. I think it's impossible. It's very much possible to, to imagine techno without compression, but reverbs and delays, they are just... It's it's like the air that you're breathing. I uh, enjoy collecting analog delays and um, use them as part of my production and, and writing process. And um, what I do a lot is that I'm recording these kinds of effects with the synth together. Of course, there will be situations where I would um, put some delays later on the sound, but um, for instance, uh, one example, the Into the Dark remix that um, is in the melodic top 10 right now, it has uh, a TB303 bass line and there's a pair of Muga Fuga delays on that bass line and I recorded, um, I basically sent the 303 through the delays um, while recording it. Of course then there's no dry safety copy but um, when this becomes such an integral part of the groove and the rhythm of the sound, um, I'd rather 
uh, commit to that and record it straight away. The good thing about these delays, for instance, is that they um, can sync to MIDI, so it's easy to get a groove that works reliably. Sometimes um, use even effects inside the synthesizers. The Matriarch, for instance, um, has an analog bucket gate delay built in, which is really nice. And the ARP 2600 has a built-in spring reverb and stuff like that. And I, I would, I would um, make this a part of the actual thing that I'm doing and then I'm recording um, the sound with it so I try to I try to record my elements as finished as possible with as much um, original character as possible and then of course I'm using delays inside the computer also and um, yeah all sorts of things whether it's a send uh, effect on a vocal whether it's um, a tempo groove delay on a hi-hat. This is something I, I do a lot that um, I don't program static 16th note hi-hat patterns, but I'm taking um, offbeat hi-hats and put a 16th note delay on it. And then I get some kind of uh, groove pattern that's a little more uh, floaty in a way. It's, it's not so static and the delay adds maybe some some, some bounce in the stereo field or even in the, in the rhythm or something like that. And um, to me, this sounds more alive than a static programmed drum pattern. Like. So these, these would be typical applications of it. Having listened to Poems of the Planet, one of the things that also I noticed was that it's around 12 minutes long. Could you tell us a little bit about what's your way of working with the arrangement and basically achieving that length also? Um, the backstory was that um, I was invited by uh, Carl Cox and Christopher Coe to uh, contribute to their new label Awesome Soundwave and I was very very happy that they, they approached me and, and asked me whether I could um, do something for them. Um, I said yeah great cool let's, let's start with an EP maybe. So, and then they said um, no we only do albums and we want long tracks. And my first reaction was, um, there's, there's no way this is going to work. How on earth um, can I, can I um, just make sure I have enough time to, to come up with um, something? And um, I was initially very happy that they, they approached me and then I was very frustrated that I had the feeling, okay, but what they, what they would like to get from me, I can't give them. And then at some point a few weeks later, I just started working on something and um, I realized that these two objectives, a full album and long tracks, was actually a liberation. And it was something I just jumped into and um, the whole album was then basically finished in a matter of, I don't know, six weeks, eight weeks maybe. It was, it was a very fast um, process. So fast, I think, in part because um, what uh, seemed daunting to me in the first place suddenly became something very, very inspiring. And, and, and I, I started to enjoy working outside the boundaries of a typical seven, seven and a half minute primetime banger. And I, I got into this mindset of creating musical worlds which, uh, uh, with even more um, scope and, and, and width and whatever. And, and um, yeah, so this was a liberating experience and it was also um, possible, I think, because the album is very, very modular based and very analog synthesizer based. And the way how I, how I worked was um, that I really recorded long passages of, of recordings and some, some of them very, very spontaneous jams. And I didn't do even so much editing to them. I mean, I wouldn't say I didn't, any, I didn't do any edits at all, but uh, my goal was to, 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 to keep it organic and, and, and create something in the dialogue with the machines and, and not staring so much in the computer screen. And, and um, yeah, so part of these long progressive dynamics and the rise and fall of tension um, comes from me just um, adjusting synthesizers over, over a longer stretch of time. In some parts of my recordings there, there might be a five or six minute long piece of something which is completely unedited and just um, sometimes a first take with all the rough energy of maybe maybe just getting a new synthesizer and, and recording the first ever thing with it and then suddenly um, what was just uh, maybe maybe I just um, 
wanted to, to quickly record it to, to lay down the idea to, to, to go back to it later on. And then I realized, no, the energy and the, the, the drive that it has, just because I wasn't uh, mentally prepared to now record the take, but, but just do it, um, ended up um, on the whole album. And, and I think this is why this is why the tracks became so long and so organic sounding also, because I really, really started to embrace uh, the concept. Yeah. 